Hello, everybody, and welcome to Fire Engineering Talk Radio and another installment of the Professional Volunteer Fire Department, the podcast that is dedicated to our great volunteer fire service and getting firefighters to embrace the message that developing and displaying and maintaining a professional image is the duty and responsibility of all firefighters, paid or volunteer. Tom Merrill here, glad to have you listening in. It's Tuesday, November 9th, and I have another nice show lined up for you, and it focuses on a a very important topic within our volunteer fire service. And actually, you know, it's actually a very important topic for the entire fire service, paid, volunteer, or anything in between. And as you know now, over the last eight years, this program has focused on a lot of different topics. Some have been tactical, such as engine operations, or I did one on grain silo rescues and handling highway uh, emergencies safely. And sometimes I'll concentrate on things that are more related to the business side or administrative side of the volunteer fire department, like recruitment, retention, leadership, uh, fiscal management, improving morale in the volunteer firehouse, which by the way, on a side note, uh, improving morale in the volunteer firehouse is a, a new topic, a new presentation that I put together and am excited to be rolling out. So if anybody would be interested in that, just get a hold of me. Again, my contact info will be at the end of the show. I'd be happy to bring it your way. But so over the last eight years, we've done a lot of different shows, tactical, administrative, things like that. But tonight, we're going to, again, get into the tactical side of things, and we're going to delve into a topic that involves the type of call that I know all of you have responded to before, and I know you will respond to again, and most likely it's the type of call we we really take for granted. I think our, our guest tonight would agree with that. It's a call where actually our guest said correctly so that you can go from hero to zero in a millisecond if we allow complacency to set in, if we have not taken the time to prepare ahead of time and talk about how we're going to respond and ha- handle maybe this type of incident. So what I'm talking about, folks, is responding to gas emergency calls, whether it's that odor call or the known leak because a contractor struck a line or maybe a meter's been struck by a vehicle. You know what I'm talking about because, again, you've undoubtedly been to these types of calls and uh, will again in your career. But tonight, I wanted to spend some time refocusing on this type of incident, maybe hit the reset button for all of us and review maybe our responses to gas emergencies or maybe even a possible gas emergency. And hopefully we can get you to again, because I know you thought about it in the past and in the past you knew you were told how dangerous these are, but hopefully again, if uh, we get you to understand the urgency of taking these calls seriously, putting a plan together and having one in place and uh, pre-planning our actions, because if we don't do that, disaster can happen. Maybe we could talk about working with our local utility companies ahead of time, because again, it's another important part of this. We should plan all of this ahead of time. And even though it might not happen uh, very often, the very real, there's very real life examples Um, They're out there of the tragedies and horrific and devastating consequences that could result um, if we don't handle what starts out as a routine odor call or leak call in a correct manner. So I want us all to refocus tonight and redirect our attention on this important subject. Maybe go back to your firehouse and review what you have in place and think about when you last drilled on this topic. And are your newer members familiar with what their actions should be? And do you have maybe new officers that have come into the ranks? Hey, January is fast approaching. We're going to have a whole new turnover, right? In most volunteer fire departments, it happens every year. Are they properly prepared? Is it something you've talked about with them on a drill or training night? So joining us tonight to educate us and remind us all and pass on some great information is a subject matter expert along with so many other subjects that he's an expert in. And I'm proud to call him a friend. I'm proud to call him a brother and I'm honored to have him on the show tonight. And it's my privilege to introduce Jerry Napa, 45 year veteran firefighter EMT with the West Haverstraw, New York fire department. He's a training officer in Rockland County. He was chief or is chief of the Rockland County hazmat team. I mean, his credentials go on and on and on. He's also a writer for Fire Engineering. He presents at FDIC, among many other venues. 
Many of you probably know him because he does a ton of work on nozzles and flows and engine work. He's featured in the highly acclaimed Brass Tacks and Hard Facts Engine Company video series. So he's out there. You probably know his name. And if you don't, you're going to by the end of tonight. Oh, by the way, I think he recently retired from the West Point Military Academy where he worked. He was just talking to me on the pre-show about his career there and a great career there, but enough of me talking. I want to welcome him to the show. So Jerry, welcome to the show, brother. Well, Tom, thanks for the introduction. Uh, hopefully we'll uh, share a little uh, life-saving information tonight in the next few minutes. Well, I think we're going to. Uh, I think there's a lot of important stuff to know. And like I said, a lot of people maybe have talked about it in the past. Maybe they get exposed to it a little bit in some of their training and then you know, uh, we go on so many other types of calls and then we get the routine odor call and complacency can set in. But before we get into that, Jerry, why don't you talk a little bit about who you are and how you got involved in the fire service? Well, I'm just a, kind of your typical volunteer. Uh, my grandfather was chief of the department. My father was in the department. My brother was in the department. So, uh, you know, like, uh, like most of the volunteers in the community, it's just something you do and um, you, you give back to your, your community that way. Absolutely. It was you in the same department that your, your father was in and brother and all same one. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I like, I say I moved all the way across town, which was about three quarters of a mile from the house where I grew up. So uh, my, my roots are pretty deep here. Like, again, like a lot of the volunteers, you know, yeah. uh, it's home and you, you do the best you can to protect your home and your community, you know, it's admirable. It's actually similar to me. Actually, I'm in the house I grew up in I yeah. the house that I grew up in. So we're very similar that way. Jerry. Uh, that's a good thing. That's oh, absolutely. Thing. So you've had quite a career. It's you still have quite a career. You're doing so much. Um, I know your work. I first got to know you before I even met you. I knew of you from your writings on engine work and flows and things like that. So obviously we're not talking about that tonight. So what, what got you into the gas side of things? Cause I know a lot of engine firefighters out there that wouldn't have anything to do or even any interest in writing and sure. doing research and presenting on gas emergencies. Yeah, it kind of comes from my West Point experience. Uh, I was a staff guy there, so uh, I did a lot of special projects. And, and, you know, you had to delve deep into it and then make a presentation to the colonel or general about what you wanted to do and that kind of thing. So it just kind of naturally kept going for me. Um, today, I want to talk about natural gas and or propane emergencies. And they're basically the same. Obviously, natural gas is lighter there. It goes up. Propane goes down. The flammable range is a little different, but basically we, we are responding to an explosive a release of an explosive gas. So most of what we're talking about is, is pretty much the same. Um, Tom, to answer your question, uh, January 16th, 2012, I responded to what I call a pain in the ass gas leak. Uh, it was another gas leak. We've all been, we all get complacent. Um, we were on the scene for 43 minutes. There was two utility technicians on the scene with us. Uh, the last house we were evacuating, uh, my captain and I, it was a locked building. It was the build, It was locked. The utility guy said to me, um, uh, I have a high ring of gas coming from the inside to the outside of this house. I need to get inside. Um, we had evacuated six or eight houses by then. This was a, a residential development. Um, in, and they were a row type houses like condos. Um, so we, I had the four gas meter with me and a six foot hook, uh, full gear SCBA. Uh, we had been in all these other houses, zero readings. Uh, we got to this last house. Uh, again, the gas technician said I've high reading gas come from the inside out. The captain called for a couple of probies to force the door because the utility guy asked us to force the door and, and remind me to talk about that because we never want to do that again. Um, uh, so uh, while we were waiting for the probies to come off the rig, uh, the house exploded. And, wow. and Tom, it, 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 was it was just shredded. Uh, it's the grace of God that we are alive. Uh, I went about 30, 35 feet from near the front door to the curb, and the captain went a similar way. He was buried under debris. I wasn't. Um, so uh, I, what I'd like to start off with, with two things or a couple things. One is I didn't know what I didn't know. And, and most of the people listening to this broadcast probably don't know. Um, I thought I knew what I was doing. Look, I was at that point, I was the assistant chief of the hazmat team. This is a flammable gas. This is no big deal. Um, 
you know, I've been to Zillionities, you know, and as, mm-hmm. as uh, Chief Goldfeder said to me, I talked to him a couple of weeks afterwards. He goes, how many guest leaks you been to? I go, oh, I don't know. He goes, 100? I go, yeah, I guess so. He goes, that last one was a bear, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. I go, yeah, yeah, Chief, it sure was. Um, so it was, this has been a real great uh, journey for me. Uh, after I, I, we were both injured, uh, he, uh, Kenny Patterson, my captain, was injured more severely than I was. We don't really know why. Uh, <clears throat> he had um, he had uh, four broken ribs, two broken vertebrae. His shoulder was damaged badly. And what was interesting was we were both burned on our head in the same place. And we couldn't figure that out. Um, it, it took us a long while to figure that out. And what it was was we, it was a friction burn from our helmets being, you know, forced off our head so quickly. It was actually a friction burn on our head because we had the exact same burns on our head, which we thought was kind of strange. Um, I, I had a fractured cheek, um, a, a severe concussion. Uh, Kenny had a concussion as well. We, I don't know what we were hit with. Um, I remember having my feet off the ground. I remember seeing my boots off the ground. I remember seeing the house come apart in front of me. And, 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 you know, it's just amazing how fast your brain works. Um, I, I remember seeing the house come apart, like in slow motion. And, and I just knew at that point. And again, I, you know, I say these things, I know, I don't, no, it was a fact, but in my mind, I was a hundred percent certain that I was just, I was at somebody else's mercy. And, um, we, whether we lived or died, we had no, no, um, no control over that. And I liken it to being at the top of a roller coaster. You, you're going, you're going down a hill and you, you can't stop it. You can't get out. Uh, and, and you hope things are good. So again, luckily for us, things, things were pretty good. Um, I, the next thing I saw was my, I was on all fours at the, looking at the curb. I had a fractured cheek. My face was bleeding. I was burned. Uh, I saw the blood dripping on, <laughs> dripping on the, the, the asphalt. And I remember thinking, holy cow, this is probably good. You, your, your heart's beating, your, you know, your blood's pooling on the street and, and that's a good thing. And then you kind of go from, that's a good thing to man, how screwed is, how screwed up is this? You know, that you're thinking you're bleeding and it's a good day, you know. So you have those emotional roller coasters, you know, which is, well, we can talk about PTSD and a whole nother, another topic. But um, so anyway, so that's how I, so I have a friend, uh, Dan Moran. Uh, he's a research chemist. And after I got out of the trauma, burn trauma center, and um, I called up Dan and I said, Dan, I, I said, I, I, this wasn't the outcome I wanted, you know, um, this wasn't the outcome I wanted. What? what went wrong? And we just started talking and we, we picked it apart. And Dan is a deputy coordinator for hazardous materials. And again, he was a research chemist. So he's kind of got a wide open, you know, field of vision there, you know, and we started picking it apart. And, and again, I didn't know what I didn't know about this gas leak. And, and we'll talk about some of those things as we, as we go through this. Wow. I would say that, you know, that experience alone would definitely make uh, anybody interested in what happened why did it happen how can i prevent this from happening again mm-hmm. how can i help my sisters and brothers to prevent this so i could definitely see that uh yeah. that you wanted to take it to the next level and and talk about it and uh, i know uh, i think your class at fdic this year focused on it as well as a webinar that you put together you want to talk before we get into maybe some of the uh procedures and after gas emergencies do you want to talk mm-hmm. a little bit about your class and that you do. And also the webinar you did for fire engineering, which I know was put together to help uh, address these issues. Sure. There's a webinar up on, <clears throat> excuse me, fire engineering's website, um, tactical response to uh, explosive gas emergencies. Uh, it'll be up for another six or eight months. Uh, it's about an hour long, kind of hits some of the key points. Um, so what the, these classes are that Tom just talked about is a result of, of the research that, that we've done, Dan and I have done, uh, about natural gas emergencies. And the, the starting point is this, is you don't know what you don't know. It's not your fault. And here's the reason why. Um, I, and when I do the class, I always ask guys, how much training have you had in natural gas emergencies? And then typically the answer is, oh, sometimes the utility comes in, gives us some PowerPoint and then a pat on the butt, and we're ready to go to a gas leak, you know? Well, obviously their gas technicians get trained a lot more than that. Um, another part of the or why we're really not ready to go to these calls is how much training have you had on your air monitor? Again, probably the same thing, probably not a lot. And uh, 
Uh, I've written a bunch of articles with Dan for fire engineering about how to conduct this training. So uh, you can just go on the fire engineering website and look at those and, and, and glean a, a ton of information from them. We won't have time to talk about all of it. Um, and the other thing is our procedures, our SOPs are pretty weak. And, and um, so I think the key first point to remember is uh, you don't know what you don't know. And it's not our fault. It's just not in our training. It's not in firefighter one. It's not in officer one. It's one of those things like, hey, yeah, you know how to go to a gas leak. Well, well, no, we don't because we've not been trained. Um, so sometimes if we're lucky, you know, the officers do the right thing. Sometimes if we're not lucky, they don't. And it's just, you know, we're making that stuff up on the scene. We've got to have procedures. And the example I always use is this, you know, uh, one of your loved ones is having a heart attack and a couple of paramedics show up and go, Hey, uh, Dan, what do you want to do this time? You know, paramedic Dan says, well, I don't know. We gave the last one epi and that didn't work so good. So let's shock this one, you know? Yeah. Okay. Let's shock them. And then we'll give them, uh, we'll give them something else, you know? Um, so we, we, you know, you expect the paramedics to have procedures based on the industry standards. And that's what we should be doing for gas emergencies. Uh, the fire department should be using modified gas industry, 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 best practices, for, for our procedures. Now it's important. I'm not talking about that down to the Nats, but, you know, step left, step right, that kind of thing, but we need to have some strategic and tactical procedures. And, and we'll talk about that in the next few minutes. Yeah, excellent. You know, and, and for the, everyone listening, you know what, we're getting toward the end of the year. You probably have some members that, you know, we all have our minimum drill and training requirements and what a great drill for a member that can watch it in their home. Uh, training officers, you can put together a quiz to just verify that they watch the one hour presentation, one hour that could save your life, one hour that will provide you with an incredible amount of information. And even if you are pretty well versed in these type of emergencies, what do we always say? There's nothing wrong with reviewing material, right? And reminding yourself and you know, if it, there's just a great idea here to watch this one hour webinar, maybe at the beginning of the year, make it a start off drill come January. I don't care how you do it, but what a great drill that you can do in the firehouse together, or you can assign it to members to watch at home. Again, if they got to make up drills or anything like that, one hour, it's, um, I believe in the name of it was a tactical response to explosive gas emergencies. You can just mm -hmm. Google that and it will come up, but it's through fire engineering. Very easy to access and download. I think they want your email address so they can send you a certificate or um, just have a yeah. right. You took it. So it's so, so worth it. And it, you find, uh, you know, again, a lot of people think oh, hum, another gas emergency, but your research has shown that there's a lot of departments out there that don't even have plan a in place, right? They don't even have a solid SOP or SSG mm -hmm. SOG for their members stepping off the rig of, okay, here's how we're going to do it. So there should be something in place. So I don't have to turn around and say, what do you want to do this time? Just like you use the paramedic analogy. Yeah, Tom, that's true. Uh, and this is career departments, volunteer departments. It, it runs the gamut. Uh, it, it doesn't distinguish a couple of things are important. Um, one of the things we, um, Dan and I went up to our public service commission in Albany who regulates the utilities. And we, we made a presentation to them saying that the firefighters, especially volunteers, and I shouldn't say that all firefighters need better training for gas emergencies. Um, and while we were there, we met uh, deputy chief, John Buckite from FDNY and uh, John's just retired, but uh, what a, what a great guy. And we, we helped each other out. <clears throat> so we, we got to work with uh, the FDNY and their research and development folks. Uh, and, and we found uh, a couple things. John, John, John was tasked to rewrite FDNY's SOP. So um, actually he it was kind of interesting. He had said he had read my articles in fire engineering and he thought he was the only guy that thought we need to revise our procedures. Well, his bosses apparently thought that too. So uh, John had about a year and a half task to rewrite, uh, rewrite FDNY's SOPs. So one of the things he came up with was, is this, a, is this gas leak a minor emergency or is it a major emergency? And, and even more important than that, life safety is our mission. Life safety is our mission. So a lot of us, I call it find and fix, right? A lot of us think we have to go in, find the leak and fix it. Well, our first priority needs to be life safety. We need to roll in thinking this is a major emergency. Now, I am not saying, and I want to be clear about this, I'm not saying you roll onto the, the residential street and start evacuating every person you see. 
That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is we need to think about this being a major emergency, and we'll talk about what that may be in a little bit. But um, need to have that mindset. So, so why don't we have that mindset, right? So we go to automatic alarm. You know, we send engines, trucks, rescues, all this stuff, right? Why? Because there may be a fire. But for a gas leak, we go, oh, here we go. It's another pain in the ass gas leak, right? Well, the reason we think that is humans can smell the odor in natural gas at about one part per million. So it's very, and it may even be lower than that. So let's just say one part per million. It takes 50,000 parts per million of gas to, to hit the LEL, lower explosive limit. So 50,000 parts per million. So we are going to these gas coals, and this is what tripped me up. Uh, we go to these gas coals all the time. Yeah, big deal. I smell gas. Not a big, you know, nothing ever happens. You know, well, we need to be thinking about this is a major emergency until we prove it's it prove it otherwise. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. And you talk about, um, I know we're going to talk about the two big ones being propane and, and natural gas. Um, and with these incidents, there can be, I believe you identify six types of gas mm -hmm. leaks, right? So mm -hmm. what, what would, what do you mean by six types of gas leaks that as we roll up, we should be thinking about? Um, we need to be thinking about the most dangerous type of leak and that's an underground leak. Um, so why is an underground leak or an outside odor of gas? Why is that the most dangerous? We don't know where it's, we don't know where it's coming from. And, and by the way, I just wrote a, a, a natural gas emergencies book with uh, Brian Folk. Brian was um, a gas guy for over 20 years in Pennsylvania. So when we talked about this, he goes, Jerry, it's not important where the gas is coming from. So I was a little puzzled. He went, it's more important to know where it's going to. And I went, oh yeah. So that's kind of a that's kind of a key lesson learned that these things are obvious and they're pretty simple when you've been trained. But if you haven't been trained to understand, um, uh, you know, a, a, an outside order of gas, how dangerous it is, uh, you just don't get it. So uh, I'll give you an example. The um, the incident that nearly killed myself and, and Captain Patterson was uh, an underground leak. A uh, contractor was boring, by the way, it was a Verizon contractor, was boring um, uh, using a, a, a torpedo, uh, a boring device to get underneath the road, and he hit a two-inch, 60-pound main. So I did not understand underground migration of natural gas. So on the side of the road, uh, the contractor had dug a trench. He put this boring device in and was tunneling underneath the road. So uh, I had walked by. The, the trench uh soon after we got there i i saw the gas you, know, you can see the soil dancing and you can smell the gas coming out so what did my training tell me it told me natural gas lighter than air it's coming out what's the big deal what i did not understand was that that not all the gas was coming out and some of the gas was going back into this house and 43 minutes after we arrived on scene we arrived on scene at 12 13 at 12 56 that house shredded and nearly killed me uh so, so the outside odor of gas is, I think, the most dangerous thing that, that I didn't understand until, you know, until about a year after the call. Yeah, and you could see the average firefighter thinking, oh, it's an outside odor call. We're fine, you know, take take your guard yeah. down a little bit. And mm -hmm. But this gas can actually seep through the ground, can it, and, and find cracks and foundations and chases mm -hmm. and things like that and enter a complex. It, it can, uh, and that's what happened in this case. Um uh, the other thing that happens with underground migrating gas, uh, Tom, that's important is the odorant can get scrubbed out because natural gas the, and, and propane doesn't naturally smell. So there's an odorant. So <clears throat> we've, um, Dan and I have been pretty, frankly, around the country. We've been as far as South Dakota, Connecticut. Uh, we're we're going to be going to Atlanta in a week or two uh, to train those guys. Most career and volunteers don't know that the odorant can be scrubbed out if the, if the gas passes through soil. Um, I don't know the chemistry of that, and it's, I don't need to know. All we need to know is that it gets scrubbed out. There was a, a very interesting um, scenario in Maine, uh, a propane leak uh, leaked into a building um, uh, over the weekend. The, the people came to the building to work on Monday morning. Uh, the maintenance guy recognized was leak, got everybody out called the fire department. The fire department shows up. Uh, the captain uh, took a firefighter and went into the basement uh, with his four gas meter. The meter was in alarm. 
So the meter is telling him, hey, bud, I got flammable gas here. Um, he wanted to make the building safe, so he, he threw the main breaker, and that is, in fact, what ignited the explosion, killed him, uh, and put the, uh, the firefighters with him in the hospital for, uh, I think it was about six months. And we know that's exactly what happened because the survivor relayed that story, and there'll be a NIOSH report on that soon. Yeah, this, I remember that. It was just a couple of years ago in Maine. And if mm -hmm. I remember correctly, one of the things that led to maybe a little complacency was because the odor had been scrubbed out by the soil. They didn't smell it. So they were even probably, I can't speak, and I don't want to sure. speculate, but I'm wondering if maybe they let their guard down a little bit because they didn't smell anything. And they thought maybe the meter was acting up because, hey, we don't smell it. But you're yeah. saying it doesn't, <laughs> you got to. Yeah. It put all the clues together, right? Because you might not smell it because it's been scrubbed out. I, I That's very interesting. I never knew that. Yeah, and, and there's a couple of really good lessons learned here. Um, <clears throat> like, like Chief Buckhead said, what's our job? Our job is life safety. There was nobody in that building. You know, they were evacuated. The fire, then the fire department, we got to fix everything. You know, and, and we've got to get over this. We, um, we There's sometimes we, we can't stop this scenario, you know, uh, or we can't we can't make it better. Um, so the action, our action should be to do nothing. And, and that's hard for us to do. You know, I was at a, my husband, my team got called out to a, what we thought was a gasoline spill and it was reported hundred gallons of gasoline from a delivery truck on the ground and the fire department's there and, and they're walking through the gas spill and they're speeding, speedy dry. You know, I'm like, guys, get out of there. You know, it's going to evaporate. The speedy dry is not going to make it not ignite. And by the way, that, that there's thousands of gallons in that truck that if it lights up, it's probably going to kill you. <laughs> you know? So but we need to think about not doing something sometimes. sometimes uh, the best course of action is no action. And just, yeah, our job, our mission is life safety. Yeah. Let's, let's do that. You know? So interesting. Interesting. Yeah. So again, we have these, uh, these, these six uh, types mm -hmm. of gas emergencies. You were just talking about the underground. What, what else should we be watching for? What are so, the yeah, actually, there, there's seven altogether. The, the seventh is a transmission line emergency, which we really don't talk about too much because, thankfully, the transmission lines are, are pretty well protected. So there's the inside leak, an outside leak, uh, uh, burning, you know, burning gas, uh, the locked building that we just talked about, uh, a main or service line damaged, and, and the seventh is that transmission line. So um, each... Uh, there's a lot of overlap with these, but um, they're, you know, I have, if anybody wants it, I have an SOP, a draft SOP. I can send you with the, f the first three strategic things we should do with each of these and the first three tactical things we should do with each of these leaks. So I can, I'd be happy to send that to anybody that wants it. That's great. And we'll, we'll give your contact info at the end and then maybe I'll, and I'll even put it up on my site when, when this uh, airs, sure. and put a link to the podcast. So let's talk mm -hmm. about, propane and natural gas. Those are the two biggies. I think we've all responded mm -hmm. to a lot of calls involving them as professional firefighters, not chemists, not technicians. What are some of the things that we should know and understand about both natural gas and propane? What, like, again, just to keep it in the cliff note version as a professional firefighter, what mm -hmm. should I understand and be familiar with, with these types of, uh, of gas? I think the most important thing, Tom, <clears throat> Tom, is that you need to you need to know how to use your meter and trust your meter. Um, that's the most important. Uh, we don't want to be trying to you know sniff for gas or anything. So, using your meter is is what's critical. Um, for uh, natural gas, the flammable range is is like four point five to fourteen. We always say five to fifteen. Five to so, 15, right, remember that. Remember that, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, five so, to fifteen. I I don't know why it sticks in my mind. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and and it, you know, like I said, it's actually four point five to fourteen something. But for us, five to fifteen. So you need five percent gas in ninety five percent air for to for the ignition. Five percent is the LEL, the lower explosive limit. The UEL, the upper explosive limit for natural gas, is fifteen percent. And very similar for propane. Propane is two percent on the LEL, nine percent on a, a UEL. So what's in, another thing that's important is the mixture in the middle around 10, per, like on natural gas, around 10% gas, right? 10% gas in the air 
is where you get the most bang for your buck. And that's the type of explosion that, that almost killed me. Is that what they figure uh, is about 10%? They did. Yeah. Uh, just by the nature and the, the force of the explosion. Uh, in my class, I have three videos that uh, they've, you know, put gas in a house and there's a lean explosion, a 10% and then a 15%, which is kind of rich. And if you think about it, like your carburetor for your motorcycle or snowmobile, lawnmower or whatever, you know, and it's too lean. It doesn't run good right in the middle. It runs really good and too rich. Again, it doesn't run so good. So you get the most energy, the most bang for your buck, if you will, in the middle of that flammable range. Gotcha. Now, if I'm a novice, what's LEL and UEL? LEL is lower explosive limit. The, the minimum amount of gas you have to have in air and UEL is the upper explosive limit, the maximum amount. So if you're, if you're below the LEL, you, so again, if you liken it to your carburetor, you don't have enough gas, it doesn't run. If you're above the upper explosive limit, um, it's flooded and it's too rich and it doesn't run either. So you got to be in that flammable range. The mixture's got to be right. Gotcha. And one is lighter than air and the other is heavier than air, correct? Yeah, it's amazing. You know, I asked firefighters, again, I've, I've trained, I don't know, I, I think we're up to about 1,000 or 1,200 firefighters we've trained in the last couple of years. Most guys don't notice. Natural gas is lighter than air, propane is heavier, you know. So so if you have your four gas meter in your hand and you're looking for natural gas, you ought to have your hand up over your head. Um, if you're looking for propane, you need to be holding it down low near the floor or the ground or wherever you you think your propane may be. And I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but doesn't that make a difference if you are going to ventilate a structure, if it's been sa deemed safe to do so, if it's a propane leak, you might want to start somewhere low or no, does that not matter? Yeah. I, I'm not big, frankly, on, on ventilating the building. Our job is life safety. Um, unless you're really good with your meter, how do you know you're not bringing that back down into the flammable range? Um, Think about a typical house ignition sources, you know, uh, doorbells, light switches, uh, the the thermostat. We, we think that's what happened in my case. It was January 16th, so it was cold. The uh, the boiler the boiler called for heat and uh, high old silver away it went. You know, wow. um, a telephone. You know, a, a cat walking across the floor with a static spark can can ignite it. So there's a zillion ignition sources. Uh, you know, and, and let me talk about this one. I'm thinking about it. This locked building. Um, if the utility asks you to force the door on a locked building, your first inclination should be absolutely not, no way, Jose, I ain't, I ain't, I ain't doing this. So again, what's our job? Our job is life safety. If there's nobody in that building, um, we shouldn't be forcing the door. Now, there's, we always have an inter interesting discussion in class. Oh, what if somebody's in there? Yeah. Well, another thing, <laughs> it, it, and, and it's a valid point, you know, but the, here's what the information shows is that from based on um, the Center for Disease Control, uh, they've done, uh, they have done a couple experiments and they find that at very low levels of, of natural gas, the odorant makes people sick. It's uh, methyl, uh, ethyl mercaptan. And so at low levels of gas, people get nauseous, they get sick. And, and I always ask people in class, and a lot of times we'll have a utility expert there with us. I'll say, have you ever heard of anybody that's been asphyxiated by natural gas? And the answer is always no. And again, I've done this class all across the country. I've never heard anybody say, oh, yeah, you know, Billy Bob was, was asphyxiated by natural gas. It makes people sick uh, at, at very low levels. I'm not talking like four and five parts per million. Uh, the odor, it makes people sick. So they tend to get out. Um, so if you have this locked building scenario, what else can you do? You know, ask the neighbors, is anybody home? You know, uh, does it look like anybody's home? Uh, uh, talk to the police. Are, are they watching the house because the people are away on vacation? So before you risk firefighters to force this door, um, uh, just so you can do a search, uh, try to try to identify that, that somebody's in there. You know, our job is life safety, not find and fix. And I got to tell you, January 16, 2012, I'd have had the irons. I'd have forced that door because the utility guy told me to do that. Right. Which, which is another lesson that's important. And President Reagan had it right, trust but verify. Mm -hmm. So just because that, that, in my case, the utility, utility guy violated his own written procedures for a locked building. His procedures said you do a tactical withdrawal, remotely shut off the gas, remotely shut off the electric, and wait for the building to vent down. And why is that? 
it's because there's no way, there's no safe way to get inside this building. There's no life safety involved, right? So we should back up. And again, this is one of those cases where we're not real good at waiting. We want to fix everything right now. We need to think about this before we commit people to this building. So if we put our two, let's say one or two firefighters um, in this building and that thing takes off, especially if they're inside, they're probably not going to survive. We, we were lucky. Um, a, lot, a lot of people ask me, why did we survive? And I have a friend, FBI bomb expert, and I called him up. I went, Jim, I, I, how the hell am I here? Why am I talking? You know. So he said, well, Jerry, he said, humans are light debris in terms of explosions. So you and Kenny took your flight. You were on the ground. And the, most of what, what could have killed you went over top of your head. And when I looked at the photos, Tom, that's exactly, there was, there was major pieces of the building that went two and three times as far as we went. So the, wow. the overpressure picked us up put us on the ground and then big parts of the building. There was a the, the one I use in class all the time. was a header board that went about 65 feet. So it went about 30 feet further than I did. And I, I said, Tom, I said, Jim, how, how did that not kill me? He goes, it went over your head. He goes, you were already down on the ground. Wow. And uh, he goes, that went over your head. Yeah. So that's, that's kind of how we survived, you know? Now, interesting. Have we been closer to the building? He said, it might've been different. Have we been further away from the building? Might've been different. He goes, uh, he goes, he, goes, he goes, you know, you're kind of lucky. I went, you know, Jim, I'm a dumb <laughs> fireman, but I have figured that out. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. That's really gut wrenching, man. And, uh, uh, and, and you know what, and obviously you're here for such a good reason. You know, you are the, the lessons you're passing on are saving lives and you are educating not just this generation of firefighters, but future generations of firefighters with your, your writing and your work. So thank you for that. So what do we want to do? What do we want to tell firefighters? We're going on that routine odor call or we're going on the gas meter mm-hmm. struck call. What, what should we be looking at doing and instituting as far as procedures, SOPs, SOGs, best pre- I don't care what you're yep. calling. <laughs> what yeah, should I, we be doing? What should we be teaching our members? What should we be looking at putting into our, our procedures? Uh, yeah, I'll talk about that in just a second. I want to mention, um, I was reading Fire Engineering, this was a couple of years ago now, and uh, I got to do a shout out to Bobby Halton. Um, he wrote an article about post-traumatic growth. Yes. And um, heard that. I, I, you know, I, I had, um, I had been through the kind of the downside of post-traumatic stress and did some counseling and, and we could talk about that another time, but I, I was kind of obsessed with, with fixing this for me and, and, and not only for me, but what, if I didn't know what other guys probably didn't know what, how can I make this better? So that's kind of been my quest and that's, one of the reasons Tom we're talking today, but I had no idea about post-traumatic growth until I, until I read Bobby's Bobby Holton's editorial. And uh, so one thing I want to pass along is if you have a bad experience, you can turn that into something good and you can make, you know, you can make, you can use that post-traumatic growth to help everybody. And that for me, that's been, been a godsend. So procedures, what um, I think we, we've got to do better with our training. Uh, um, if you look at the articles and the, the web uh, cast that we've talked that Tom, that you talked about before, it shows you how to train with live gas in, in your firehouse with a tabletop demonstration with your gas meters. So we, we've got to, we've got to, we've got to understand our, our meters. Um, so another key, key step is read the damn directions to your four gas meter. And everybody goes, oh, yeah, I don't want to do that. You would be surprised what you learn. So we were training a department uh, here in Rockland, very well-funded department, good guys, you know, well-trained. And uh, we were talking about the meter. I said, how long does it take to warm up your meter? Nobody knew. So uh, make a long story short, we, we came back for the second session, and uh, the chief goes, hey, I, I got to talk about our meter for a little bit. So he read the directions to the meter, and he told them some things about told their, his guys things about the meter they didn't know because they simply hadn't read the directions. So uh, he goes, it takes five minutes to warm it up. And a guy, an officer in the back of the room slapped, slapped the table with his hand. He went, I'll bet that's why we get zero readings all the time. No way. Yeah. So here's a department, good Never. guys, well-trained, aggressive firemen. 
read the damn directions to your meter. You would be surprised. Here's another one. You go into a, you go into a house, you get a CO reading. Is it CO? Could be. Do you know your CO sensor is cross sensitive to propane? It's cross sensitive to hydrogen that you may find from cooking off, you know, uh, lead acid batteries. Like if you went to a garage or something where the batteries were being charged, right? So it's cross. So your CO meter is going to say, "Hey, I found CO." No, it didn't. It found hydrogen. It's also cross sensitive to acetylene. So let's say you get a leak in a, you know, you, you get called for whatever, and maybe the guys at a, it's a Home Depot, it's a, it's a, 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 you know, a guy that runs a plumbing business, he's got a acetylene tor- torch. Your CO meter, your CO sensor is going to say, "Hey, I found CO." Yeah, well, it found acetylene. So you got to be, you got to be thinking about all these things. And I think Tom, the first thing is you got to think. It's not simple. You know, gas leak is it's a hazmat. So we need to be thinking about uh, thinking about those things. So you, we got to be better with our meter. Um, you know, let me just tell you something, Jerry. It just you reminded me of something with that uh, CO, um, an old time firefighter. Back when I was an assistant chief, I remember going on a call. An old timer told me that uh, one source causing CO detectors to activate. I went on a routine CO detector call is when a battery backup on a sump pump goes bad. Um, He told me that um, the charger overheats the sump pump battery and that releases whatever odor that gets picked up by the CO meter. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. It could be, if it's a lead acid battery, Tom, it could be hydrogen because it comes off the the acid, the uh, sulfuric acid. So um, that could be one thing. So, yeah. Um, I, I think the other strategic thing, excuse me, we need to recall is that our job is life safety and we need to be thinking about that. We need to not park in front of the building. Um, we've been to, again, in my, my class, uh, let me just tell you guys, I have a, a FEMSA uh, grant so we can do this class for you in your station. Uh, if we can agree on a date and a time and a place. So uh, uh, feel free to contact me and we can do some training for you and, and get you over some of these things, but um, please don't park in front of the building. Uh, I've been to some career and volunteer departments and, and they, you know, I ask them, where do you park? And, well, we, we, we try to park. And, you know, some, some guy in the back generally goes, no, we don't. We park in front all the time. You know? <laughs> so yeah, they knew where you were going with the question, but they didn't want to admit it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I'm like, you know, guys, just don't do that. You know, just, just, uh, you know, think about, oh, so the other important key, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. this is an important, I, I coined a term, I call it the kill box. It's like the collapse zone. But if, if this gas leak goes bad, you know, and you're in the kill box around the leak, it, chances are you're going to get killed now. So when you do your size up, you know, look at, look at, uh, kind of just like you do a collapse zone, you know, just kind of figure it out and, and you don't have to run like chicken little, but, you know, think about what your kill box is going to be and a good job for the safety officer. So while I'm talking about that, I, I want to, there's a, a new tool in the market. It's made by Sensit Technologies, S-E-N-S-I-T, Sensit Technologies. It's a laser-based gas detector. Uh, it's handheld. It's about as big as two uh, cell phones stacked together. Um, it shoots a laser that detects only natural gas. So the laser, um, so for size up, you pull up on a scene of say an outside odor of gas. Uh, you can point this laser at the storm drains and see if it's migrating into the storm drains, which may be going back into the house. You can point it at the sanitary sewers to see if it's there. You can point it at the gas meters that are on the side of the house to see if it's see if the gas is leaking from there. Uh, the laser penetrates windows, penetrates most window glass. So as a size up tool, and again, this was one of the things we learned from FDNY, they were experimenting with three or four different manufacturers. We like the one from Sensit Technologies. It's called the LZ, um, Lincoln uh, Zulu, uh, LZ30. Uh, I think it's going to be like the, um, uh, the ticks, you know, the ticks, not everybody had a tick in the beginning. Now everybody's got a tick, which is, which is a good thing. But this mm-hmm. laser-based gas detector by Sensit Technologies, and again, I don't sell them. I don't make money selling them. Uh, for us, it's a huge, huge life safety issue. Gotcha. I gotcha. So we, you know, we're on our way to our gas 
emergency call. We should be able to know whether it's inside, outside, burning or not. Mm -hmm. Stay out of the kill box. Oh, I think the emergency response book is a 300 foot limit or something, but that's correct. Isn't correct. Practical, but uh, it's something to think about. Stay out <clears> of the <throat> box. So we're getting off the rig now. Again, I think it's important that you emphasize this enough, but let's remind our listeners life safety, life safety, life safety. That's what the fire department's responsible for. So don't go bull rushing in there right away that, you know, it's not a fire ground search. And as you said, the very small chance that anyone's in there, they're going to self evacuate. If the odor is present, it's going to make them ill. And mm -hmm. again, I can't think of any stories that I know of where people have been overcome by natural mm -hmm. gas, but there's really no way to safely enter a building suspected of a gas leak. Is there? No, especially if it's a locked building. Cause you don't know, you know, you can't get a, a really good indication. Um, again, what, what I want guys to think about is they're stepping off the rig. Is this a major emergency? Are people, are, are lives in danger? And you need to do your size up. You know, um, you, you're probably going to, I would park a house or two away, um, send the gas meter with a firefighter and an officer up to, you know, the, the occupancy is reporting. And obviously you're going to, you're going to talk to the building occupants. Um, uh, full gear and SCBA. Mm -hmm, full gear. Yeah. Um, I'm not at this call. I'm not big on SCBA. And, and here's the reason um, we, need, we haven't talked a lot about the meters. If you, your fire department needs an action level. So think about it this way. Your, your chief has given you a, an instrument. that's going to give you a number, right? Just like a watch or a clock. So what happens at 12 o'clock at 12 o'clock? We eat lunch, right? Sure. Well, your meter is going to alarm at 10% of the LEL, 10% of the lower explosive limit. The meter is going to alarm. Um, so that could be your action level that, that could be mandatory evacuation of firefighters and civilians, but your department has to choose an action level. Uh, some departments by us use an odor of gas to evacuate the building. Um, one of the things we just included in our SOP is just like if there was smoke in the building, we will evacuate people from that building, you know, right away. So if there's an odor of gas in the building, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to, Get the people out, say, where do you smell the gas? Um, we're going to take gas readings uh, at two places. One is um, uh, right inside the front door. Uh, and if you get your action level there, you're not going any further if you hit your action level. The other thing uh, we like to do, especially for un unknown sources of leaks, is go to the basement. And that's called a POE, the point of entry. So if there's an underground leak, Where's the gas going to come into this building? It's going to come into the basement. It's not coming in through the attic. It's not coming in through the second floor. It's coming in, you know, it's going to seep through the ground. So we want to get a reading right inside the front door and then get somebody to the basement if you can to, um, you know, to check the POE, the point of entry. Point of entry is where the pipes go into the building, you know, water, mm -hmm. sewer, that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. So, uh, so that's kind of key. Gotcha. And there's really... Um, what did I want to ask on that with the, uh, with pulling up? Um, we're not there to fix the problem. We're there just to find the leak. And I like what you said earlier. It's more important to know where the leak is going, not where it's coming from. I thought that was excellent. And wasn't there something too that you taught in your, in your webinar about frost? I thought that was really interesting. Frost can really impede natural gas from rising up. Yeah. I didn't know this. Uh, again, it's one of the things that I didn't know almost killed me is <clears throat> it was January uh, I'm in I'm in New York, so we had a frost layer in the ground, and uh, the the boring device hit hit uh, the gas main underneath the, the street. But so the the gas normally would have escaped, or some of it could have escaped through the soil. But because of the frost layer, it provided a cap, and and the gas will take the path of least resistance, like water. In this case, it couldn't go up like it wanted to, so it went sideways into the building. Wow. So yeah, Tom, good, good point. Yeah. Yeah. I thought that was really interesting. And another thing you mentioned in your size up is, are you dealing with a, with a, a major leak, a minor leak? Uh, is there a way that we can kind of judge that based on what we're seeing or the readings we're getting? And... Yeah, it's kind of hard. It, it kind of develops through your size up. You know, um, I guess if you're going to an outside odor, 
to me, that's the scariest, uh, has the most potential because we don't know where it's going. It could be in all the buildings around. Uh, that normally doesn't happen, but it could. Um, another good tactic is if you to use, they call them, the utility calls them subsurface structures, especially the sanitary sewers. Because the, the sanitary sewers go back, you know, there's a pipe that goes back into every building. Uh, so if the gas has migrated into the sanitary sewer, uh, it has a pretty good direct path back into the building. So, so monitor that subsurface structure, and uh, you can pull the pull the um, pull the uh, cover, pull the cover off a sanitary sewer, and that kind of the equivalent of cutting a roof. Natural gas is lighter in the air. You, you, you've you've made a path of least resistance for it. And that being said, sewer gas is methane. You know, methane is methane. So. Uh, you might get a, a light, you know, a low reading of gas in any in any sewer, uh, but if you're getting, you know, 10, 20, 30 percent LEL or higher, I, I, it's not sewer gas; it's natural gas. Yeah. yeah, and I would I would assume we or I, I would guess that we want to assume it's a major leak until we prove otherwise. When we're rolling up, we yep. should be thinking major leak, correct? Yeah, correct, correct. And, and uh, I should have mentioned this earlier on. One of the things that I think is really important is. The fire department's got to get with your local utility. Your procedures should mimic theirs. They are required by law to train you at least once a year. So, so feel free to go out and, and ask, you know, and, 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 um, you know, make, make those guys come train you. It's a legal requirement for them to do that. And, and more than 30 minutes and a pat on the ass, go, go to a gas leak. You know, we need to be doing more than that. Right. And, and I know you mentioned, you know, there's no safe way to enter the locked building. Uh, do your due diligence before entering any building and, and have your marks mm -hmm. of what your procedures are going to be based on what, what, whether you smell it or whether your meters are telling you something's going on, have your procedures uh, set up in place ahead of time and train your members ahead of time. <clears throat> um, when, what, if we determine we need to evacuate people, um, I believe there was a, a poster child of a, of a case in uh, Queens, I think where, um, maybe they didn't evacuate properly. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a little bit about that? I, I can. And that's an excellent point, Tom. Glad you mentioned it. Um, just like a fire, who do we evacuate first? We evacuate those that are in the most danger, closest to the fire. So if you're doing an evacuation, start your evacuation from closest to the leak outwards, away, away from the leak, because those people that are closest to the leak or where it's going in the buildings or whatever are in the most danger. Uh, I, we didn't know that um, in 2012, uh, and I, I did it myself. We, we started, you know, down kind of pretty much about a half a block away and worked our way toward the leak. Uh, we just didn't know better because, and you know, we beat ourselves up about that quite a bit. But again, it comes back to we, we just weren't trained. And um, actually, it was in 2009, so three years before my incident, Con Edison in New York City um, their procedure had them evacuating and toward the leak. Um, while they were doing that, this was in uh, Floral Park, Queens. While they were doing that, the original caller's uh, apartment blew up and, and killed a killed a woman. So that's when they changed their procedures. So again, we didn't. There was three years before my incident. We didn't know that the utility didn't share that um, with us, and there was no mechanism to train us. So, you know, we we should have known better, but weren't trained. Right, right, right. Well, we're always learning, and yeah, you know, unfortunately, sometimes we learn from tragic mistakes. And uh, but that's good to know, and that's good info. And um, should we be sending like in my area, the meters are all outside. Should we be assigning a firefighter to the meter? And um, does he just shut it off if wait uh, <laughs> for orders? Or what? <laughs> there's a couple things. Um, shutting the gas off, I, I say, is always an option at a gas leak. Now that doesn't solve everything, but it stops the flow of gas. Um, the other thing that's really important for size up is if you look at your gas meter, your residential gas meter, there's a dial in there. It's called a half a foot dial, one half a foot dial. So if there's gas going in that building, that half a foot dial is going to be spinning. And you can, you can look at this yourself. Uh, you know, put your hot water heater on, put your boiler on, you know, turn the oven on, go outside and look at your half a foot meter and you'll see that little, beauty is going around pretty quick indicating that gas is going in the building so um does it mean there's a gas leak in the building no but if there's a known leak um 
that, you know, if you have a crescent wrench or a Halligan tool with you uh, in command direction, you can shut that gas off and, and hopefully prevent a problem. We were, uh, this past summer, we were at a call like that. Uh, the lady was cleaning her stove. She tipped the stove over, uh, had a, you know, open pipe, you know, the uh, flex line in the back of the stove. Uh, she had completely severed that. Um, uh, when I got to the, when we got to the scene, uh, a couple of the officers went to interview her and we knew that the pipe was broken by dispatch information. I went to the meter. Um, I, w- I went to the meter. The half a foot dial was spinning. So I assumed that that gas was free flowing into the house. I had my Halligan shut the gas off and, and you know, uh, help, help mitigate it. So sending that person to the meter, uh, especially with a radio, uh, good, good idea. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to take a second and remind the listeners that uh, this is fire engineering uh, blog talk radio. Thanks for listening in tonight uh, to the professional volunteer fire department and a uh, special thanks to our guest, Jerry Knapp, as we discuss tactical response to explosive gas emergencies. So much great information um, that we've been covering here today about our responses. And I wanted Jerry, I wanted to take just a few minutes if you wouldn't mind You've mentioned it a couple of times, but let's call it meter knowledge or meter facts, right? Uh, what are some of the things we should know about? We all have them on our rigs. And you're right. I bet you very few people have ever read the directions. Maybe they've gotten a very quick uh, five minute lesson on, yeah, push this button. If it goes to this level, we got a problem. If not, <laughs> worry about it. What, what are some of the things we should know if, about the meters? Well, there's a couple of very important things. Um, you should pair up your foregas monitor with a metal oxide based sensor. <clears throat> and uh, these, you may recognize these instruments. They, they used to make a ticking sound. And the closer you got to the gas leak, it, it was like a guy or counter, it would tick. So you should have a metal oxide base, based unit. And they're, these are cheap, they're about 400 bucks. And again, Sensit Technologies makes what I think is the best one. Um, so you should have that metal oxide base sensor paired up with your four gas because the four gas sensor has a different technology in it. Um, the, your four gas instrument has generally oxygen, carbon monoxide, uh, another toxic, typically hydrogen sulfide and your explosive gas sensor, right? Your, your it's a, typically it's a catalytic bead sensor. So there's some interesting things with that cat bead sensor. Um, it's, it's not very sensitive at low levels. So all of us have pretty much gone to a gas leak and this, the four gas reads zero, but yet we're smelling gas. And the reason for that is the, that, that catalytic bead sensor in your four gas is, is uh, blind below, and it, this number varies, but in a laboratory, he's blind below 500 parts per million. In reality, it's more like 2,000 or 3,000 parts per million. So in the 1% to 2% LEL range, um, the, the meter's not seeing it. And it's not seeing it for a couple of reasons. One is it's not sensitive enough. And two, there's software built in to go, ah, look, don't, every time you get a, get a sniff of this, don't, don't go into alarm. You know, let's, not, let's not go into alarm until we're really sure it's, in, it's an alarm. So um, that metal oxide sensor I just talked about is going to detect really low levels, like around 10 parts per million. So you need that metal oxide sensor. Uh, we call it sometimes an explosive gas sensor detector with your four gas. Because the four gas is really made for, for what? For confined space. It's not made for detecting explosive gas. That's an excellent point. Yeah, that's when they became real popular, when the, con- the confined space became all yep. the age with training and... Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So now that everybody goes, oh, I can't afford these sensors. So that $400 um, uh, metal oxide sensor will detect other uh, flammables as well. Uh, other flammable gases will detect ammonia. Uh, it does about 12 different gases. So uh, it's a good, we call it a survey tool. If you, you know, if you have a four gas and you, let's say you get called to a, you know, a, you know, a leak of a refrigerant or or, uh, you know, some other gas, at least, at least the metal oxide would go, Hey, you know, Hey Tom, I found something here. I don't know what it is, but I found some, it caused you to, you know, like pay attention. Um, the other thing I'd ask you to look for is your, um, their oxygen reading. Um, um, 
1%, if you normally oxygen is at 20.9% on your meter, if you have a, a reduction in 1%, so you go from 20.9 to 19.9, that means there's 50,000 parts per million of something else in the air. You're not going to know what, but if it's toxic, for example, that's a lot. So if your oxygen reading is going down or going up, that's a big tap on the shoulder. Go, hey, Tom, uh, something's going on here. I don't know what, but you ought to be looking around for something else. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and again, I, I just let me finish with this. Read the damn directions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, and you mentioned earlier, another thing you should really know is, is such a basic question. How long does it take your meter to warm up? I know we, yeah. we harped on that when I was a chief and assistant chief. Um, with our CO meters, you know, let it warm up outside. Don't just walk in the house with it right away. It's uh, these, these other meters, right? So, so here's the, it's called a T90 time. It's essentially how long does your meter take to get a 90% confidence in the reading it's given you, right? right. right. It varies. It varies. So again, read the directions, you know, your, your directions will tell you what your T90 time is. So what does that mean? That means you don't go tralala and walking through the house with the meter in your hand. It means you go in the front door and you stop. And if your T90 time is 30 seconds, guess what? You need to stand there for 30 seconds because if you walk through the house and then the meter goes into alarm, you don't know where you got that reading. Right. So we, 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 again, not our fault. We haven't been trained to use that instrument. Um, when we do our leak straight training, we force guys to go slow and, and, you know, monitor properly. Now, I know one of the things with meters that always gets intimidating for firefighters, and, and I dare say, I bet you there's a lot that probably don't do this the way they should. What about regular maintenance? What about regular calibration, meet, uh, sensor changes, things like that? Are the newer mm -hmm. ones better and easier? Or is this something we should still really be concerned with and make sure we're doing due diligence with the maintenance? Um, yes and yes. The new meters are, are a little bit better. Generally, the sensors will last a couple of years. Uh, the older sensors, even the best best sensors would only last a year. Um, but I mean, if it's, I mean, if it's not calibrated, you're, you're making life and death decisions with that instrument. So, I mean, it's, it's got to work right. You know, so what I recommend to, to fire departments, both career and volunteer is if you've got a science teacher or you got somebody that really likes doing this, um, assign him or her to that, uh, make sure it's calibrated, uh, whatever the calibration schedule for that instrument is. We, we do ours once a month. Um, it's, it's important training. It's, it's important, you know, uh, maintenance, just like for your saws, for your pumps, for your SCBA, um, you're making life and death decisions with that thing. And, and one, it's gotta be calibrated. So it's, it's reading the right thing. And two, we've got to know how to use it properly. Right. And I really like what you said about have, have an action plan for, I, I don't remember what the exact term you use, but I wrote mm -hmm. down action plan for mm -hmm. what you're doing at the different steps that the meter might indicate you're at. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the action level. So that's that should be in your SOP. Uh, you know, again, and, and think about it, especially like on the volunteer side, it's Tuesday morning, you got slappy and pappy, and maybe it's not your eight, eight you know, your 18 there. Uh, the, the senior leaders in your department owe those guys specific directions. Um, you know, when 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 you get, say, if your action level is 10% LEL, and your meter goes into alarm, that's mandatory evacuation, they know, you know, they know, they're not going to fool around trying to find a leak anymore. It's like, Hey, we hit the action level. We're out of here. Life safety is our job. Right. So, uh, yeah, it's, uh, was there a, was there something you mentioned? I, I just wrote down, um, another hazard. Um, was there a, something with the new corrugated stainless steel tubing that you're saying there's a hazard with, is this something new that you're, you're seeing? Um, it, it's new. It's new to me. Uh, apparently it's been in use for quite a while. Um, we used to see uh, gas piping in buildings. We call it black pipe. Black right? pipe, yeah, right. Right, so it's rigid. Um, so with the new technology, uh, there's a thing called CSST, corrugated stainless steel tubing. And what it is, it's, it's flexible gas pipe. And it's allowed to be used to, to, instead of putting black pipe in where you have to cut everything to a custom oh, length. And, and yeah. Yeah, thread it. Thread it, yeah. Um, this stuff is, is flexible. Uh, it comes in rolls. I, I think it's 75-foot rolls. And um, 
it's kind of like the old BX cable. It had that flexible metal jacket on it. Um, but again, this is for gas emergencies. So um, what we found is, and if you, um, uh, I can't remember the fellow's last name. There was a firefighter killed in, in Virginia a few years ago. Uh, there was a lightning strike near this house. And the lightning strike energized this corrugated stainless steel tubing. And because it was flexible, it, it kind of shorted amongst, you know, kind of shorted itself out and got some uh, pinholes in it, created a gas leak, created a fire, and the subsequent fire and collapse, flash over and collapsed, um, uh, killed uh, Lieutenant Nathan. And I apologize, I can't think of his last name right now. So um, if you think about it as, uh, you're all familiar with the flex line on the back of a stove or a dryer. Sometimes it's called a whip or a flex line. It's very similar to that, only it has a rubber jacket over it. So the problem has been is some of the original installations have not been grounded properly. So if there's a lightning strike or electrical, significant electrical short in the building, it's possible this will leak and obviously cause a fire. Uh, some of the newer types are have a grounding sheath in it but um you can look it up on the internet corrugated stainless steel tubing uh it's cheaper faster to put in um obviously not as strong as as the black pipe we're all used to mm -hmm. yeah but easier to install and that's that's why that's <laughs> <laughs> there you go Jerry, we've been going for about an hour here. I know we've covered a lot. Is there anything you can think of that we missed or that you really wanted to reinforce? Again, let's maybe go through some of the, the, the big points here. You know, work with your local utility agency and establish a relationship with them mm -hmm. so you can get some operating procedures down. Uh, take this seriously. Think about it during your training season. Again, it's a drill you can assign members to even do on their own uh, with the mm -hmm. webinar and other information that's out there understand the meters you have in your firehouse, get the damn directions out and read them and, them <laughs> and uh, stay out of the kill box. Don't go bull rushing in when you, when you pull up to these types of calls, assign mm -hmm. somebody to the meter. Uh, mm -hmm. What else do you want to tell our listeners about the importance of uh, responding correctly and safely to gas I, emergencies? I think using the, the correct technology, the, the laser gas detection, uh, again, it's called an LZ30. It's made by Sensor Technologies. You can look them up on the web. I think that's a game changer. The, um, the metal oxide sensor is also important. Um, and, but again, Tom, I think you hit on it. Get, you know, get with your utility. Our procedures should mimic the utilities. Uh, uh, for training funds, guys that, that run training centers, the, um, in New York, it's called um, the Department of Public Service or the uh, Public Service Commission. Uh, they have tons of money and they have money for training. So in our case, uh, we, uh, the utility was fined $150,000 for, I say, always say trying to kill my captain and I. Um, we got that money uh, sent to Rockland County and that's how we built our training uh, site with it. So if you're if you're associated with a training center in New Jersey, it's called the Board of Public Utilities. But there's a in every state, there's a group that regulates the utilities. Um, they routinely fine the utilities for mistakes they make. And you can get that money to come to the fire service if you just talk with those people. And, and uh, in, in two meetings, we had $150,000 in our pocket for mm. training. So wow. it was good. Yeah. Real good. That is real good. So establish those relationships, folks. Put your procedures in place. Train on this. Understand, yeah, you can go to uh, 99 that are just routine and boring, but that 100th one can get you. And, and I mean, Jerry's uh, <laughs> alive and well to tell us about that today. Thank God for that. And um, I'm sure that people are going to have questions for you, whether it's about meters. Maybe they want to bring you in uh, to talk more about it. Um, questions from what we talked about today. Would you mind providing some contact information, how people can reach out and talk to you about this some more? You also mentioned you have the SOPs, SOGs you'd be happy to provide. Mm -hmm. Yep, I can do that. Uh, my email is J for Jerry. Uh, my See, they're already calling you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, you know, the response from the, 
the across the country from the webinar stuff has been terrific. So I appreciate being able to help out these these other departments, and maybe we can prevent you know a guy from guy or gal from getting killed. But my email is uh, J for Jerry. My last name Nap K N A P P numerals two three at AOL, and I'll give you my cell as well. It's uh, eight four five 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 eight zero four eight nine. So it's JNAP23 at AOL and 845-558-0489. And if you, for some reason you can't get me, Tom's got my number. Yes, I do. Reach out to me as well and uh, is an AOL guy just like me. <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> uh, I tell that story all the time on the show. My kids make fun of me all the time, but I'm like, hey, it works. Why would I want to change? So uh, Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Well, I can't thank you enough for taking this hour, a little more than an hour to, to just touch the surface on this very important topic. Um, I know we're going to impress upon our members out there to, to maybe go back and revisit what they have in place and to refocus on this on a drill or training night. Again, folks, a lot of great information out there. Um, check out that webinar um, that is available through Fire Engineering. Uh, what is it, Jerry? Tactical response to gas emergencies. Um, yes. You can just Google that or go on fire engineering. They have a search bar there and it's well worth that hour. Assign it to members that need drill or training requirements. Put a little Q&A together on it and boy, mm -hmm. you, you know, your company's going to benefit. And last mm -hmm. but not least, read the damn manual for the meeting. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. That's probably the most important message. There. Oh, no. Oh, so much great information. I think we covered a lot. Um, I really thank you, Jerry, for coming on today and uh, much, much appreciated. Well, thanks for having me. And hopefully, uh, you know, we, we uh, say, saved a brother, sister, fireman from a, uh, a bad day. So I thanks agree. again for having me and uh, please be safe out there. Absolutely. Thanks again. And again, folks, reach out to him. The man is just a wealth of knowledge. Someday we'll do something on flows and things like that. Hose maybe. And oh, there's so much we could talk about. So I'm going to have you back on. And we'll keep talking, Jerry. Thanks. Sure. Thanks, Tom. All right. Well, I'd also like to thank Fire Engineering, Chief Bobby Halton, of course, Clarion Events for supporting my podcast and all the other great podcasts on fire engineering blog talk radio. It's just an honor that I can do this and that you take the time to listen in. And I want my listeners to know I remain committed to all of you that continue to focus on topics of relevance and importance and uh, to our wonderful uh, volunteer fire service. And in today's case to our fire service, because sometimes this information is beyond the volunteer firehouse walls. It's for all firefighters. If anyone wants to reach out to me, please do so at tamerrill63 at aol.com. Again, tamerrill63 at aol.com. Please be sure to check out any of my social media platforms. I have the Facebook page, the Professional Volunteer Fire Department. It's on Facebook. It's on Instagram. It's on Twitter. And I like to post articles and information. I'll be posting some of the links for Jerry's material, uh, always posting motivational words of wisdom to help us all better navigate through our volunteer fire service work. World. Also have a YouTube channel, the Professional Volunteer Fire Department. All my podcasts are there, nice and neat, chronological order. And sometimes I post other videos on there as well. I have a historical section with old, cool old movies and videos. If you like that, check it out. So again, love to hear from all of you. So feel free to reach out to me. My next show is scheduled for Tuesday, December 14th. And again, I look forward to talking about the great fire service that we're all involved in and topics of importance and relevance to all of us. So thanks for tuning in tonight. And uh, folks, remember, true professionalism is defined not by a paycheck at all. And your residents are owed professional service delivered by professional firefighters representing professional organizations. Thanks to Jerry Knapp. Thanks to Bobby Halton and Clarion Events. Thanks for listening in, folks. God bless. And we'll talk to you in another six weeks. Take care.